Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the recognized nuclear weapons states. We are beginning our first serious unit in this course, focusing on which countries developed and which countries did not develop nuclear weapons. And we're beginning with a special category, namely these recognized nuclear weapons states. What do I mean by that? Well, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is the main document in international proliferation law. We'll talk much more about the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT for short, much later in this course when we focus on the non-proliferation regime. But the short version of it is that the non-proliferation treaty obligates signatories to not develop nuclear weapons. However, there are five exceptions to that rule. When the non-proliferation treaty was signed, five countries had nuclear arsenals, and those countries, by the terms of the non-proliferation treaty, are allowed to keep those arsenals as long as they are making a good faith effort toward disarmament. These five recognized countries have more than just that in common. They were also the first five countries to develop nuclear weapons. They are the United Nations Security Council permanent members, and they are the major power winners of World War II. Well, who are those countries? Let's go through them in order of who developed nuclear weapons first. The first country to develop nuclear weapons was the United States. This was in 1945, in the middle of World War II. Technically knowledgeable countries were racing to develop nuclear weapons to help win the war. The United States had its efforts focused in what became known as the Manhattan Project. And interestingly, we can trace the origins of the Manhattan Project directly to the rise of the Nazi Party. How is that? Well, when the Nazi party came into power, this man, Albert Einstein, was in the middle of a tour of the United States. Recognizing the writing on the wall, Einstein chose to stay in the U.S. Fast forward many years, and the United States is involved in World War II, when Einstein co-authors a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In this letter, he outlines the possibility of nuclear weapons, and recommends that the president create some funding for the development of such a program. This is what leads to the Manhattan Project developing. Where does it go from there? Well, many years after that, the United States is capable of creating a nuclear device, and the first atomic detonation became the Trinity Test, which was detonated shortly before the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And this is, in fact, an image of that first ever atomic blast. It was successful, and the United States have a couple of different bombings in Japan shortly thereafter, one in Hiroshima and one in Nagasaki. These bombs were technically different, and when we start talking about how to develop nuclear weapons, we will get a greater appreciation of the differences between the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. These were those bombs. In fact, on the left we have Hiroshima, and on the right we have Nagasaki. In 1949, the Soviet Union became the second country to develop nuclear weapons. This was right as the Cold War was beginning to start, and the Soviet Union, as well as the United States, were beginning to feel the pressures of geopolitical competition. Unlike a country that might be starting a nuclear program from scratch, the Soviet Union had an advantage. Namely, they had placed spies in the Manhattan Project and within the United States' nuclear industry more generally. You may have heard of some of these people, in fact. For example, Klaus Fuchs, as well as Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. The United States was aware that the Soviet Union was trying to develop a bomb, but decided not to intervene. This was for many reasons. For one, the United States was exhausted from World War II. They had just ended fighting of the biggest war in the history of mankind, and were not particularly interested in restarting that war industry to be able to fight the Soviet Union. The United States also suffered from a lack of intelligence. The U.S. was so focused on winning World War II and focusing its spying efforts on Nazi Germany and Japan that it had no intelligence assets in the Soviet Union. This meant that the United States didn't really know what to hit in the event of trying to fight a preventive war specifically to stop the Soviet Union from developing nuclear weapons. As a result, this would have required a broader-scale war effort to fight 
an entire conflict within the Soviet Union's landmass, which, given the exhaustion from World War II, was not something that the United States was particularly interested in engaging in. The last factor was that the United States underestimated the Soviet Union's speed of developing a nuclear weapon. When the Soviet Union tested in 1949, the United States was under the impression that the Soviet Union was going to be still a few more years out. The reason for that discrepancy, of course, is those spies that we just talked about. Those spies gave the Soviet Union an advantage in not making the same sort of technical mistakes the United States was making, not having to go through the same sort of learning process. That accelerated the program and allowed the Soviet Union to test in 1949. In 1952, the United Kingdom became the third country to develop nuclear weapons. In fact, the United Kingdom was working toward a bomb during World War II in that initial race for nuclear proliferation. The code name for their project was Tube Alloys. However, Tube Alloys did not get particularly far in terms of progress. The United Kingdom faced a strategic barrier. The Great Britain landmass is only a channel away from continental Europe. The United Kingdom therefore had to be worried that if they were in fact to get, say, maybe 75% of the way there, that a single invasion would completely destroy any sort of progress that they made. Realizing that, the United Kingdom shifted its program to North America and eventually merged with the United States' Manhattan Project. Under this agreement, the United States was supposed to share any progress that it made on nuclear weapons. And this eventually assisted the United Kingdom in making a bomb in 1952 out of fears of invasion from now the Soviet Union. Operation Hurricane was the name of this bomb, and here we have an image of that initial detonation. In 1960, France became the fourth country to develop nuclear weapons. There are two main explanations for this. First is your standard security-based explanation. This was the middle of the Cold War, after all, and France had a rivalry with the Soviet Union. Moreover, there were concerns within France that should the Soviet Union stage an invasion of the European continent, that the United States and the United Kingdom would not come to the rescue. But by having its own nuclear deterrent, France could convince the Soviet Union to stop short. The other explanation is prestige-based. At this time, France was undergoing a prestige deficit. After all, this was during the time of the Algerian War. And by developing a nuclear weapon, so this argument goes, France could reaffirm its position as a serious, major, global power player. In 1964, China became the fifth country to develop nuclear weapons. Like the other countries on this list, China felt a security problem. Namely, they were threatened by U.S. strength that was exerted at the end of the Korean War. Policymakers in China believed that a nuclear deterrent would counteract that. Now, under normal circumstances, one might expect communist China to rely on the Soviet Union's nuclear strength and free ride off of that. Well, it turns out, occurring at the same time, was the Sino-Soviet split. There was a fundamental fracture in communist philosophies in Moscow and in Beijing, which drove those two regimes apart. And so China, feeling that they could no longer rely on the Soviet Union to help them out, believed that their own nuclear deterrent was the way to go. And this marks the end of the five recognized nuclear powers. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and in the next lecture, we'll talk about the five unrecognized nuclear powers. See you then.